Hello guys, I am Barney Deepak and welcome back to our Basics of Mechanics lecture series. Now, if you are following along, we have been covering the basic concepts of engineering mechanics and in the last video, I gave a quick introduction about the resultant force. Today, I am going to elaborate it a bit and going to deep dive into the methods of calculating the resultant force. So, without further ado, let's begin. I have here two forces, F1 and F2, in a two-dimensional space. If I need to calculate the resultant of these two forces, what other options do I have? Now, I know that the resultant force is a single equivalent force which can replace these two forces in a system. But, how can I calculate this resultant force? What is its magnitude and direction? Well, to help us, there are three laws. First one is triangular law. Second is parallelogram law. And third one is polygon law. Let's look at one by one in detail. First, we'll be discussing the triangular law. So, you can use triangular law to calculate the resultant forces of a two-force system like here. But there is a procedure to do it. First, you need to rearrange these forces into a tip-to-tail order. This, for example, is the tip of the force vector F1 and this will be its tail. So, what we're going to do is, we need to connect the tip of the vector F2 with the tail of the vector F1, like this. Now what's very important is, this tip to tail formation must be geometrically similar to that of the original force system. What do I mean by that? For example, if the force F1 is inclined at an angle of theta with the line of action of the force F2, then in our tip to tail formation, it should have the same inclination theta with the line of action of the force F2. So, once we have rearranged our forces like this, all we need to do is to draw a vector to complete the triangle and this vector is our resultant force. Mathematically, resultant vector is a vector sum of all the forces acting on a body and since force is a vector quantity, we can apply this concept of vector addition to calculate the resultant force and therefore, our vector is equal to the vector sum of F1 and F2 forces. Alright, now we know how the resultant force look like but we still need to calculate the magnitude and the direction of it and for that we need to do some math. So, let's jump in and try to derive an expression for the magnitude and the direction of our resultant force. To begin with, let us assume that our resultant force is inclined at an angle of say alpha with respect to the force F2. And let us say F1 is inclined at an angle theta with respect to the line of action of force F2. Now, our motive is to calculate the magnitude of the resultant force in terms of Newton and this angle alpha which will help us to define its direction with respect to the force F2. To calculate these, I'm going to make use of trigonometry and for that, I'm going to need a right angle triangle. So, let's draw a right angle triangle like this. And we shall name it. Alright. Now, all we're going to do is just apply the Pythagoras theorem to our right angle triangle ADC to calculate the magnitude of the hypotenuse AC, which is our resultant force. So, let's do it. Now, according to Pythagoras theorem, we have AC square is equal to AD square plus DC square and I can rewrite AD as the summation of AB and then BD. So, let me rewrite this as AB plus BD whole square is equal to, uh, sorry, plus DC square. So, let me expand this now as AB square plus BD square plus 2 times of AB times BD. plus DC square. Now, if you consider this small triangle here, we have BD square plus DC square as the hypotenuse of this small triangle which is BC square. So, let me replace that as AB square plus BC square plus 2AB times BD. Now, I have AB. AB is nothing but our F2 vector, but I don't have BD. So, to calculate BD, I'm going to consider this small triangle BDC and uh, try to find out um, a few trigonometric ratios and calculate the sides of this triangle BD and DC. So, in this triangle, 
BDC sine of theta is equal to CD divided by BC. So, CD is equal to BC in this case is nothing but the magnitude of F1 vector. So, F1 times sine of theta and when I try to calculate the cos of theta for this triangle, I have BD divided by BC. So, from this I can calculate BD as BC times cos of theta and BC is F1. So, I can simply write F1 of cos theta. So, that's our BD and that's our CD. So, let's plug in this BD in this equation here. AB square plus BC square plus 2AB times F1 cos of theta, right? So, let's replace all this AB, BC in terms of uh, magnitude of F2 and F1 vectors. So, AB is nothing but the magnitude of F2 vectors. So, F2 squared plus BC is nothing but the magnitude of F1 vector. So, F1 square plus 2 times F1, F2 cos of theta, R square. Now, we don't want R square. We just want the magnitude of the resultant vector. So, R is equal to square root of F1 squared plus F2 squared plus 2 times F1 times F2 times cos of theta. Now, with this formula, we can very well calculate the magnitude of our resultant force R. For the next step, we need to calculate the angle alpha to know the direction of our resultant force. Using basic trigonometric ratios, we can easily find this out. Let's calculate tan of alpha. Tan of alpha is opposite to the adjacent side of the triangle ADC. So, let me write it. Tan of alpha is equal to DC divided by AD. Now, again, you can split AD into AB plus BD. We know what AB is. It's the magnitude of the force F1 and BD is F1 times cos of theta. We have DC as F1 times sine of theta. So, let us substitute all the values in here. F1 times sine of theta divided by F2 plus F1 times cos of theta. So, this is equal to tan of alpha. Now, we don't want tan of alpha, we just need the angle of inclination alpha. So, alpha is equal to tan inverse of F1 times sine of theta divided by F2 plus F1 times cos of theta, where theta is the angle of inclination of the force F1. So, with this, we can calculate the angle of inclination of our resultant force. Now, there is also an alternative way to calculate the angle of inclination of the resultant force and that's by using law of sines. Let me give you a quick overview of this law. According to law of sines, ratios between the length of a side of a triangle to the sine of the angle opposite to the side are always equal. So, in simple term, it gives a relationship between the length of the side of a triangle and the angles of the triangle. So, we can also make use of this relation and can express the direction of the resultant force in terms of a sine inverse function. Let's see how we can do this. So, here again we have our two vectors F1 and F2 and we have the angle of inclination alpha for our resultant force and the force F1 is inclined at an angle theta. So, when we are using law of sines, what we need to understand or what we need to have is all the inside angles of a triangle. So, we have here alpha and this angle ABC is 180 minus theta. So, with just these two angles, we can able to calculate the angle of inclination of the resultant force using law of sines. So, according to law of sines, we have magnitude of R divided by sine of 180 minus theta, where theta is the angle of inclination of the force F1, which is equal to F1 divided by sine of alpha. Now, if we can rearrange this, we would have sine of alpha is equal to 
F1 divided by R times sine of 180 minus theta. Now we need just the alpha so we can rewrite this as a function of sine inverse like alpha is equal to sine inverse of F1 divided by R times sine of 180 minus theta. So that's how we can play with math and come up with different formulas to calculate the magnitude and direction of the resultant force. Let's now move forward to parallelogram law. Now this law is also applicable for two force system and we need not have to rearrange our force vectors into tip to tail form. Instead we need to construct a parallelogram with the two forces as their sides and our resultant force is just the diagonal of the parallelogram passing through the point of application. This resultant force is again the vector sum of our two forces F1 and F2 and here again we need to calculate the magnitude and direction of the resultant force. Now don't worry, we are not going to do math here again. We just saw how to calculate the magnitude and direction for the triangular law. We can take over some steps, if not the entire steps from that to do our calculations here as well. What you need to understand is, if I extend our parallelogram like this and create a right angle triangle, you can see that this part of a triangle is exactly the same as the previous case for the triangular law. And what's great is we had already derived the formulas to calculate the magnitude and direction for such a system, right? So that applies to here as well. Now the last and final topic for today is polygon law. We can use polygon law when there is more than two forces acting in a system like this. In this case I have four forces F1, F2, F3 and F4. And to draw a resultant force, we need to rearrange these forces into tip to tail format. As you can probably would have guessed, the resultant force is the closing side of the polygon. Also do not forget, when you are rearranging the original forces into tip to tail format, you need to keep the orientation in mind. Like we discussed in previous two cases, here as well the resultant force is the vector sum of all the forces. Now to calculate its magnitude and direction, what you can do is, you can first calculate the resultant force R1 of force F1 and F2 and then you can go ahead and calculate the R2 the resultant force for R1 and F3 and finally you can calculate the entire resultant force R for the forces R2 and F4 but I know this is a long process and you can probably make some error while doing the calculations if you are wondering whether there is a simpler method to calculate the magnitude and direction for a system with more than two forces you would be happy to know that there is actually a method to do all this in a much easier and simpler way. That's what we're going to see in our next section. So we have our four forces and what we got to do now is we have to resolve all our forces into horizontal and vertical components. So in this example F1 is already horizontal and F3 is already vertical. We just need to resolve F2 and F4. If you have watched my second lecture, you would have probably found out the horizontal and vertical components of F2 and F4. If you haven't, check out my second lecture, link to which is there in the description and also up in the cards. The horizontal component of F2 is F2 cos of alpha and for F4 is F4 times cos of 180 minus theta. Now you might wonder how did I come up with this angle of 180 minus theta. Now let's zoom in a bit and see that the angle between F1 and F2 is theta then what would be the angle between the line of action of F1 and the force F4? This would be 180 minus theta and that's how we got 180 minus theta here. So let's continue. The vertical component of F2 is F2 sine of alpha and for F4 is F4 times sine of 180 minus theta. Now the next step is to calculate the overall horizontal and vertical net force in the system. To do that you just need to add all the horizontal forces and vertical forces separately. Let's say Fx is the net horizontal force and Fy be net vertical force acting on the body. Let's draw the net horizontal and vertical forces. Look at this, we now have simplified the system of four forces into a simple system of two forces. Now we can simply apply the triangular law and close the opening side of this triangle to get our resultant force. Also now you know the formula to calculate the magnitude and the direction. The magnitude of the resultant force R is given by this formula 
for a right angle triangle like this the angle theta which is the angle of inclination of the vertical force is 90 degrees so when you substitute this value of theta into the formula you would have cos of 90 degree as 0 so this term will become 0 so we would just have f is equal to square root of fx square plus fy square and similarly when you substitute 90 degree in the formula to calculate the angle of inclination of r we have sine of 90 as 1 and cos of 90 will become 0 so this term will be 0 and this term will be 1 so what we would get is alpha is equal to tan inverse of fy divided by fx so that's it guys I know this lecture was too much of math but that's what mechanics that's what engineering is all about I hope you liked the lecture today if so consider giving a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel I will meet you guys again in another lecture bye bye